Hello to all of our listeners, to our Pleasant Green congregation, to those who have taken out time to join in with our study of our weekly Sunday school lessons. We just uh, pray the peace of God upon all that are under the sound of our voice. And we are here to study for this Sunday, February the 7th, 2021. Uh, This is Lesson 10. It is out of our third unit of study entitled, The Call of Women. The Call of Women. And this particular lesson is entitled, No Insignificant Witnesses. No Insignificant Witnesses. Our devotional reading is out of the book of John, the first chapter, verses 37 through 51. Our background scriptures are, from the book of John, first chapter, again, verses 37 through 51, and then our printed passage and the second part of our background scriptures is from the fourth chapter of the book of John, uh, verses 25 through 42. And our key verse is from the fourth chapter of John, and it is verse 39, And uh, I will read the NIV version, and it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, which was, He told me everything I ever did. Our lesson's aims are, Identify the barriers that Jesus crossed in conversing with the Samaritan woman. Sense the wonder the Samaritan woman felt in her encounter with Jesus. Share with others the transforming power of God at work in your lives. And our lesson had three parts or three different areas of study. And the first one is entitled, She Calls. And then the second one is entitled, He Calls. And then the third is subtitled, We Clean. So she calls, he calls, and we clean. Now, I, uh, I'm not going to uh, preface uh, what we uh, begin our study in uh, by identifying it with um, any type of uh, sympathetic or apologetic or even a agitated or advocate uh, tone of voice. But uh, the time uh, dictates that we have to look at things clearly and head on. If we ever intend to receive what God has intended for us to have. And so, uh, but I must say that when I read the unit titled The Call of Women, and then I read the uh, title for this Sunday's lesson, uh, No Insignificant Witnesses. And uh, as I pondered over the two titles and I said, isn't it something? Here we are in 2021, and um, 
we're speaking of the call of women in the ministry of God. And then we address, we address it by saying that there is no insignificant witness. And uh, it, it proposed to me as though it was like an awakening that we now recognize and acknowledge that no one and even women are not insignificant witnesses. But the no one has never been, and this is in my humble opinion, but the no one has never been in question as to if men were insignificant witnesses. But now we're addressing the call of women and we're using the title, No Insignificant Witnesses. Now let us begin to indulge uh, into our lesson. Uh, the first aim says to identify the barriers that Jesus crossed in conversing with the Samaritan woman. And in our lesson, if we uh, read over the biblical context here, uh, we find uh, that the, there were uh, certain uh, do's and don'ts that were present um, in the culture and in the social setting in that day. And by the mere fact that Christ stopped and spoke to a woman of Samaritan origin, a people who had been denigrated to the status of outcast, uh, a people who, if we used political terms, we would uh, describe them as being marginalized or that they were uh, somewhat um, uh, isolated or, uh, or that they, they were disenfranchised. Uh, but these were a people that were denigrated. They were looked down upon because they were of uh, mixed race. It was not of their choosing. The people who denigrated them were the people who brought them the misfortune because it was the Israelites who were instructed not to marry or intermingle with the Samaritan people, foreigners, a people who were not of the same race as the Israelites. But, and in the biblical context, uh, it gives us some background scriptures uh, to uh, give us an update, to bring us full focus into how this whole issue of the Samaritans being someone who were discorded and denounced as unfit. Uh, in Ezra, the 10th chapter, verses 10 through 11, and then Nehemiah, the 13th chapter, uh, verses 23 through 25. But these people did not ask to become what they became as a result of the Israelite, Israelites not following the instructions that they were given. And although they didn't ask for it, 
they were still ostracized. They were denounced. They were denigrated. They were spoken ill of as a mixed breed, not fully this and not fully that. But it was because of the disobedience of Israel that brought the disdain to the Samaritans. And so as a result, uh, because she was a Samaritan woman, Christ broke a barrier by engaging with her in conversation. And when we look at this, uh, first we should identify and recognize the significance, since we're speaking of insignificant witnesses, but we should look at the significance that was placed upon the Samaritans. When we first see this here, uh, in the beginning of the fourth, tap, fourth chapter of John, and it goes to the fourth verse. In the King James, it reads that, and he must needs go through Samaria. And in the New King James, it says, but he needed to go through Samaria. So although others stay, try to isolate themselves from the Samaritans, and although others chose not to engage or interact uh, with the Samaritans. Uh, they are half-breeds. Uh, they are a mixed race. Uh, they're not pure. Um, while others chose to uh, discord them as unfit, Christ said that he must needs go through Samaria. And so that we can really package this and understand what's being said here. Uh, first, we should look at what was the driving motive behind Christ that made Christ do so many things that those around him had who had become so uh, indoctrinated and so accustomed to and so cultivated into the separation and the lack of for others who were not deemed as worthy as themselves. But if we look in the fourth chapter of Luke and the 18th verse, it lets us know why Christ always rose above the dictates of culture and society and man-made traditions and customs and laws. Because Christ said in the fourth chapter of Luke, the spirit of the Lord, not man's laws, not a government, not customs, not traditions, but the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because of this, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I know some of y'all won't preach to folk if you can't raise an offering. If uh, certain, if, if if there's not a certain tab on the delivery of the message, uh, you know, some learned men of God during that time and today uh, won't speak to the poor. But uh, that should be a distinguishing factor that lets others know that, well, then they must not be endued by the spirit. Uh, it must be some other driving force that caused them to speak to the poor. But the scripture says that to preach the gospel to the poor, 
The Spirit has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, not to just acknowledge that there are some people among us that are brokenhearted, but to acknowledge it and then do something about it. And it said to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim deliverance to the captives, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is what caused Christ to say, regardless to what others have attached to these people referred to as the Samaritans, I must need go through Samaria. And it's interesting that when we look in the text that it says that the woman, and this is in the uh, beginning of She Calls, and it says that, well, the woman said, now this is after her and Christ have already engaged in a conversation prior to the 25th verse. So you really should start reading at the beginning of the fourth chapter of John all the way through uh, to the conclusion of the verses we have in our lesson today. But it, it says that she answers Christ and she says, I know that Messiah translated the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared to, him, to her that I'm the one, the one who's speaking to you right now. I am he. I am the Christ that you've heard about and that you're looking for. You're actually in the presence of that Christ right now. I'm talking to you. And it tells us that then at that time the scripture jumps and it goes to tell us about then his disciples returned and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked him, what do you want with her or why are you talking with her? As they were engaging Christ, then it says the woman left her jar and the woman went back to the town and told the people what she had heard and who had she, she had been talking to and what she had seen. And because of the enthusiasm, because of the excitement, because of the overwhelming presence of Christ in her life and what that must have done to her countenance and her own persona when she was in the company of others. Now, we must also remember that when she spoke to Christ, she revealed to Christ, or Christ, let me back it, back that up. She, she received from Christ that he told her that she already had five husbands. And the one she was with, the sixth person she was with now was not her husband. Uh, apparently she was working on number six. But she had five previous husbands. So just think about this now. Uh, how many other people knew that she had five husbands and she was with another man now? And now this woman is coming back to the Samaritans and she's telling them about she met another man. But this man told her everything that she had ever, that was ever known about her. He told her everything about herself, and he has just now met her. Now, it's interesting that when we uh, look at the text, it doesn't mention the woman's name. It tells, her, tells us just a few things about her character, but it doesn't tell us her name. And this 
brings us back to the barriers that were broken when Christ conversed with the Samaritan woman. It tells us that it didn't need to mention her name because it wasn't that it was a slighted slant on her not to identify or recognize her name, but what it is a expression of is, is that it was not just that it was this woman, but it was the same response from the Jews at that time was the same discord for all Samaritan women no matter what their status was, no matter how many husbands they may or may not have had, it was the same attitude towards all Samaritan women and not even just Samaritan women, but also women among the Jews. So, this uh, uh, second class status that is highlighted but not verbally defined in the text is that it didn't need to be a name attached or uh, assigned to the woman because this was the attitude that was displayed towards all Samaritan women. And it, it lets us recognize then, okay, so what was, as the first lesson's aim was, what are these barriers that Christ broke? We noticed that the disciples responded in a way. Uh, they said, uh, to themselves, but no one actually uttered it. No one voiced it uh, to Christ. But uh, they marveled about it. Uh, in their minds, uh, they thought about it, but no one said anything. And so uh, it tells us that uh, from that, when she left, that uh, they directly went into um Master, Rabbi, have you eaten? Um, they had just uh, traveled and Christ had been teaching and it had been uh, all day and uh, they decided, well, we will go and uh, bring a meal. Um, we need to eat. And the Messiah, the Christ, the Rabbi, uh, he needs to eat. And so they don't voice what their thoughts are. They don't say what they're thinking. But they go on into, well, master, have you eaten? Uh, so it says, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. And then uh, he brings in, a very uh, significant uh, thought. He unveils something to them and he calls. In our second part of our lesson, he unveils something to them that is very profound. And so we wanted to uh, address, okay, wh what was so significant about uh, what uh, uh, Christ did by speaking to the uh, Samaritan woman, and why was that so out of place? Uh, why was that, you know, considered to be a head turner, uh, causing the disciples to uh, uh, wonder, uh, why, what is he doing? What is he doing talking to this woman here? Uh, doesn't he know better than that? Um, uh, well, I'm not going to say nothing, but uh, Master, are you hungry? Uh, do you want to eat? And then Christ unveils to them this. And in our second uh, part of our lesson, and he said to them, I have food to eat 
that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him some food? Uh, did you, did somebody come back here early or something? Did somebody bring him something to eat? Um, who? Who? And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and a harvest, a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Now, <clears throat> when we uh, look at what Christ is saying to them, I want us to uh, focus on uh, what he mentioned when he said that uh, his food, um, his his diet, um, uh, uh, his his appetite was to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You can become full from doing and fulfilling the will of God and the reward of just being in God's will can be so overwhelming that it can remove your thought process from regular natural and earthly uh, uh, desires or appetites. So when Christ was explaining to them that um, I have food uh, that you don't understand. Uh, I have a, a diet that, that I'm feeding upon that, that's not uh, in your regular diet. And so I wanted us to uh, look at what Christ meant when he was speaking of that um, I, my food is to do the will of God and to finish his work. And so in the uh, 38th verse of the sixth chapter of John, the sixth chapter of John and the 38th verse, uh, it reads, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Now, this is Christ speaking forthrightly about what his diet is, what his appetite is, what fulfills him is to do the will of God, the Father, to do the will of him who sent me so that of all that my father has called unto me that I won't lose any of them. And while the Jews and while those in positions of authority and those that were known of the law, uh, while they would not engage and they had put these barriers up uh, from the Samaritans, it definitely was not God's intention 
because God sent his son and his son said, I got to go through Samaria because in Samaria, where the Samaritans are, there are those that are there that also are a part of my father's collection that he has called me to come and bring back to him. And this is the fulfillment and the finished work of God Almighty. This supersedes what earthly man has decided in their own heart and in their own wickedness and in their own scheme of things. But God said, go into Samaria and speak unto them. And I'm going to send my message through you, through a person of disdain. I'm going to send it to a woman. And I'm going to have the woman to bring the fold, to bring the flock, to bring my other sheep. There's a scripture that says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. So when we look at this, uh, there's something else here uh, where Christ is speaking about the harvest. The right time to gather the harvest is when the fields are ripe and not at some seldom or random date in the future. Now, when he spoke about the harvest and when he was talking about that uh, you say, and this is in verse 35, he said, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? And uh, he was denoting something that was normal in their practice. And what he was trying to get them to see is, is that they were speaking of a natural harvest that came up from the soil of the earth. Uh, but what he was trying to get them to see was the real harvest, the harvest that God actually had planted. And so he was trying to get them to see that this is the harvest right here. That, and, and we'll see that uh, when we look in the last section of our study, which says we clean and we will recognize that Christ was speaking of the multitude that came from Samaria, these people that uh, had been denoted and spoken of as uh, a mixed breed, these people that had been spoken of as uh, idolaters, these people that uh, worshiped strange gods, these people that didn't follow the totality of the law, these people that were lost, these people that were uh, ill spoken of. But when we look at the conclusion of our lesson, we find that they came running to Christ after the woman's testimony, after her witnessing to them. They came running. The people that other folks said, you can't do nothing with them folk. They don't know nothing. They don't want nothing. They are a mixed breed. You can't help them. They're lost. Uh, they're beyond uh, salvation. Uh, they, they're beyond uh, being uh, repented. Uh, they, they're beyond being corrected. But when they heard the witness of the woman, they came running to hear Christ. And then they were so overwhelmed by what they heard from Christ until they asked him, don't leave. Stay with us a few days. And uh, I, I still need to talk about this harvest because uh, Sometimes we get so caught up in doing things according to schedules and calendars, and we missed opportunities that were right in front of our face. And one of the things that uh, 
was brought out here uh, about the harvest and the four months. Uh, four months from now, it'll be time for the harvest. Um, and they were speaking of uh, a practice within the uh, Jewish uh, faith. Uh, uh, this was referred to as Sukkot. Sukkot is a Hebrew term, not Greek, but Hebrew. And Sukkot in Hebrew is for the Feast of Tabernacles. And this one word, Sukkot, has multiple meanings and practices. Because while it is referred to as the Feast of Tabernacles, it's also referred to as the Feast of Booths or Tents. And then, while it is also referred to as the Feast of Booths or Tents, it's also referred to as the Feast of Nations and or in Gathering. And it talks about it happening at the end of the year, according to the Hebrew practice of when they would bring in the fullness of the yield of the harvest. And therefore, it was referred to as the end gathering. Now, um, there, this came as the last part of the three major feasts that all Jews were supposed to attend. And so... Sukkot, recognizing or, or being uh, identified as the Feast of Nations, Tabernacles, and in gathering. In the in gathering phase, it was the fruit harvest. So it talked about how others had planted seeds. And sometimes those that planted the seeds may not have been there to reap the benefit of the harvest. So others benefited from what someone else did last year during the planting season. And so now we come out and we're reaping the benefit of what others, the works that others had done. And so Christ was telling the disciples that my father has planted some seeds and has had others tilling the field, planting the seeds in the minds of my people. And now I have come and established you as disciples to go out into the vineyard because as the scripture has often said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So Christ was saying, there's a harvest right here. There's a hunger. There's a yearning. There's a longing among these Samaritans, which was demonstrated by them coming after they heard the report of the woman and then bade Christ, don't leave after you've incited us, after you have, have delivered us, after you have overwhelmed us, after you have spoke peace to us, don't leave. Stay with us a while. Let us sup with you. Let us eat with you. Let us feed off of that food that you were telling your disciples that you had a food that they didn't know anything about. You had a meal to share that they wasn't, it wasn't in their diet. They didn't know anything about this food. We want that meal. We want to feed on that. Fill us up on that. Stay with us a while. And so when we look at this, um, and, and again, feast, uh, from the Hebrew word, when we speak of feast, feast, the Hebrew word for that is moed, 
M-O-E-D, Moed, and what it refers to as is a fixed or appointed time. Fixed or appointed time. This was the fixed and the appointed time for the Samaritans. And God sent his own son from heaven on high. And while they had become uh, discorded, spoken ill of, and ill-treated, there is a God that heard and answered their prayers. And so when we look at uh, this whole culmination of how all of this came together, uh, I want to give credit uh, and acknowledgement uh, to the founders of the uh, uh, program, the ministry, not program, but the ministry at our church, uh, the Samaritans. Notice there, that uh, it was titled after a people that scripturally we read uh, were not a people that uh, were spoken highly of. But yet the program, the ministry at our church is referred to as the Samaritans. And it's because of the response of what the Samaritans hungered for. Our ministry at our church, the Samaritans, is to call to us as believers and members in the congregation of Pleasant Green to donate our money. And that's right, I said to donate money to this ministry because the purpose of it is for us to support and try to be a resource to our young people who are going out into the vineyard to have God's seeds planted in their spirit so that they will come out and work the harvest of the Lord. Again, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so we notice that when Christ distinguished who the neighbor was, and I'm sure we're all familiar with the story about uh, the Good Samaritan. Remember, a man was robbed and harmed and left in a ditch, and a Levite who knows the law, crossed over on the other side of the road and left the man in the ditch. And then a Pharisee, who also knows the law. But they both found something where uh, they were justified of not to help the man. They left the man in the ditch. But an outcast, a half-breed, a mixed breed, a person that was denigrated and spoken ill of, the Samaritan came by and found the man and helped the man, took of his own money, and as he was on his way to Jerusalem, he told he went to the caretaker and said, take care of this man's needs and whatever is owed, I will pay that on my way back. And Christ made this parable and taught this lesson and at the end said of these three who is your neighbor and from that we ha- we received the good samaritans and our church is doing the same thing we are asking for donations not for ourselves Uh, not for some lavish affair, but to provide support, financial support to our young people so that they will be equipped, so that they can be 
educated. And I should make a distinction here, not just academic or technological education, but spiritually educated to go out and serve in the vineyard of the Lord. Uh, um, I'm going to conclude here. Uh, this lesson had uh, so much packed in it, but time is of essence. So as always, we hope that something was said that uh, was an encouragement, that was uh, spiritually uh, fruitful, um, and, and will help us uh, to go forward in the work of kingdom building for God. And as always, it is our prayer that the blessings of God will now and always be upon us as not just hearers, but as doers of his word. God bless you and God keep you.